I was just in London and I came out of a tube station and uh, there was a, a 3D um, LCD projector with a 3D image and it addressed me by, na by name and then told me where things were in the area that I'd be interested in. And it was an experimental thing, I had it on video. So uh, it was really interesting. I don't know, I think they took it off of my credit cards? I don't know how they knew it was me. Maybe my cell phone? I don't know. It's frightening. We were starting out by just finding out what folks were interested in, and I wanted to get a little better sense of the room. Um, a lot of y'all are undergrads. Some of you are graduate students. Uh, do we have any fa a couple faculty members, a couple staff folks in here? Uh, um, how many of you have started a company already? Right? Okay, how many would like to start a company in the next couple years? How many of you see entrepreneurship in your future for sure? Okay, so a lot of you, many of you. And those who didn't raise their hand, you have to stay longer. I'll, I'll have a much longer lecture for you after that. So I'm going to try to not turn this into a lecture because it's a small enough group we could actually have a better conversation. I've got like a million slides. I don't have to use any of them. Uh, we could actually work through kind of uh, some of the key questions. And I wanted to kind of tease out something that's a little bit beyond what you're reading now about lean startup, right? Have you all heard that term of art, lean startup? It's pretty well, well vetted. And the real inspiration behind lean was to really advance the needs of customers, you know? And it actually goes back to a core process of problem solving, and that's as old as academics, right? How many of you are spending time every day in your academic studies solving problems, right? Mm -hmm. Learning how to solve problems, learning how to conceptualize problems. Well, what entrepreneurship has, you know, surprisingly learned is, uh, you know, in order to get really better solutions, you have to understand the problem in a more nuanced way. And it's not enough to understand it anecdotally, you've got to understand it almost from the standpoint of uh, a religion. You have to know it in a deep way, right? So there's nothing hugely dramatic about that, but it did do a course correction, entrepreneurship, and I call this talk kind of the old thinking versus the new thinking, because the old thinking was, for lack of a better word, path dependent. Right? We were on a trajectory where we thought we knew everything, we could invent it, and the field of dreams would actually result in some kind of customer adoption, right? And what we've realized is the engagement with the customer is actually quite handy. But I look at that, believe it or not, as a, and I want to challenge you in the room to take it beyond just accepting it at face value. I look at that as 1.0 entrepreneurship. And I'd like to actually challenge you to think through 2.0 and 3.0 entrepreneurship. A lot of you are innovators. I honestly think innovation is a core element of entrepreneurship. But in order to do something at a more advanced level, we have to think about really finishing, right? All of you have ambitions. How many of you want to change the world, right? Seriously, how many of you want to change the world? Raise your hand, right? Everyone wants to change the world. Why? Why do you want to change the world? You don't like it, do you? There's a lot about the world that sucks. A lot of problems, right? I always think when there's a real challenge in uh, the world, that's when entrepreneurship thrives, because entrepreneurship's fundamentally about action and secondarily about problem solving, right? But all of you probably conceptualize future vocations, future activities you do, future roles you'll have as a problem solver. So you don't necessarily have to be an entrepreneur, but I will tell you that entrepreneurship's a state of mind. So if you say I'm not an entrepreneur because I've never started anything, then I want you to give yourself the permission to use that label. Because entrepreneurship has nothing to do with starting a venture. It has everything to do with the way you see problems and how you prosecute those problems. And giving yourself the permission to go do something about it. Have you all given yourself that permission? And seriously, some of you have, some of you are like, yeah, I'm doing it, right? <laughs> but some of you are thinking, eh, I don't know. I, it's not for me, I'm going to just fit in somewhere. I, I, look, I, I don't know enough. And y have you ever noticed that there's this narrative that goes on usually when you're, you know, riding a bike or walking down the street or in the shower or something, this narrative that, you know, if you ever played it out in the real world, I call it the subtext, that subtext defeats you. Have you noticed that? There's a subtext of a narrative that you always play in your head and it doesn't even connect up. You know, if you study, any of you study logic, any philosophers in the room? Is there a philosopher in the house, right? When you, right, good. When you think about syllogism and building up a, a logic in an argument, usually the arguments that are in the subtext of your head are not syllogistic. You know, they, they aren't a, on a rational, not a cohesive narrative. So what I'm gonna ask you all is to examine either now 
or later that subtext that's keeping you from doing it, right? Because guess what? Your generation is the generation that will be in the position to have to do it. Our economy is being blown to bits as we speak in a very, I think, potentially positive way that um, ultimately you all will have the tools to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And let me tell you why. Your parents and your grandparents could not conceive of business models that you could execute on today. Why do you suppose? You put some of these smart Duke brains to work. Why, why, why are business models available to you that your parents couldn't even execute on? I mean, there's some obvious things, right? I'm thinking like distribution channels, like a phone app. Like you can create something that can instantly access like hundreds of millions of people. Exactly. And now it's actually finding specific sets of people, right? It's totally addressable. So the conversion of the web, now conversion of mobility, now the prolific use of data is all semantic, right? We can get to people. Whereas in the old days, it was about a merchant in a store in a local economy. Localization is largely broken down. What other factors are there? Ease of starting the business, which is currently like, you know, that's like tons of research has been done and you could do like as much as possible now. It's amazing. You have platforms to do it on the internet or something. It's fa fascinating. Okay, let's just uh, crowdsource a couple. I got all sorts of tools out there. I'm going to start out maybe Trello to do project management. Maybe uh, Google Drive to actually share stuff. YouTube, I mean, uh, YouTube to distribute stuff. Maybe uh, Skype to communicate across teams. You can build teams all over the world, right? Keep going. What other tools are out there? Point of entry to customers is vastly different. Oh, oh, so tell me more. What do you mean? I mean, like, decades ago, most of all, you could always have access to communicate with a customer in local restaurant or newspaper. Yeah. But now it's an app. Yeah. Yeah, you're collecting information all the time. Right. You know, it's almost like we have information overload. I've been, uh, I was a software guy in the age of hardware. I lived in the generation where software guys were a dime a dozen and hardware guys ruled the world. I was born 10 years too early, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and now I'm a software guy in the age of software, but I, I'm so out of date at this point that there's no hope for me. I'm going to, counting on you all to take us to the next level. What's fascinating is, you know, in the old days, putting together uh, data that we can capture now in terabytes form on our computer, on our laptop sitting right here. It's just fascinating. Think about the implications of big data from the standpoint of analytics, from the standpoint of problem solving, from the standpoint of modeling new process. Think about what you could do with human health data, for instance, if you know, HIPAA and privacy wasn't a, a, that big of a factor. That's an interesting impediment, isn't it? We all want privacy, but when it comes to solving big human problems, we need data. Right? Um, we could have a whole dialogue just on that, right? Just think about the power of that. Okay, we've hit two of the three. Prolific information, information economy driven by, you know, the web, I guess. What else? Access to capital. Yeah. So tell us more about that. It's democratized. Um, Kickstarter. Yeah. Really, really easy. So uh, now we're seeing crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. Not only Kickstarter, but now we're seeing things like uh, Etsy, where you know little craft guys can sell products in large markets, right? You've got uh, other things like um, Quirky, where if you have a pretty cool consumer product, you can take it to market. Uh, really amazing. Well beyond just crowdfunding, it's crowdsourcing, and there's a huge crowd. Okay, now we're dancing around the big thing. There's a lot of human capacity on this earth. What else is there? It's the fourth piece. I think world need, uh, we need innovation uh, more than just managing existing business. Yeah. As an as a, you know, economic frontier is came to the limit. Yeah. I think we need to open up something new to find a new opportunity. Yeah, open innovation, right? I mean, we're talking about how do we, uh, I don't know, I could just go off on that. You know, globalization is an amazing force. Thinking about um, the, the people that are all over the world and, and what they bring to the table and now we can truly not only uh, trade with people all over the world, but we can share knowledge and build teams cross globally. How many of you are working with colleagues right now on other continents? Huh? Yeah. How many of you have active friends that you've never met? Right? I mean, that proves it. It's a really interesting time. And guess what? Your parents couldn't raise those hands. Your parents knew everybody in their hometown. They knew everybody in their state, maybe. I mean, they would know people in their state, not everybody in their state. 
But, you know, it's all localization economy. And I, believe it or not, I love localization economies. We, I've, most of my research is in that kind of phenomena. But the truth is, uh, we're being blown to bits in a very positive way. This is a great opportunity for you. So the new thinking is drive on those four tenets, right? You know, the old days used to be you had to ha execute a business from the standpoint of a structure, and that structure had to be communicate, communicated in something that looked like a master's thesis, if not a doctoral dissertation, in a way that um, was very precise. Why? There was a desire among people who were investing in ventures and wanted to de-risk the problem, right? So they thought by providing a lot of information, a lot of research, research on competitors and, and the like, you'd be able to de-risk the problem. The truth is, by doing new venturing, it's iterative and, by definition, the arena of risk. Um, we could have a really interesting conversation because I was one of these guys. How many of you, well, I, this is a tough question. I'm going to not ask you to raise your hands, but I want you to think about this. How many of you think you're the smartest person in the room? <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably pretty common, especially given the segmentation of this room. You have some of the brightest, most intelligent people. You've, you've, been, uh, you've been congratulated on all classical levels, you know, been admitted to a great research university. Congratulations, you've made it. Does that make you a great entrepreneur? Absolutely not. In fact, in many cases, it's inversely correlated. You know why? Entrepreneurs give themselves the permission to act. And a lot of times, we overthink things. I'm just like you, by the way, right? I spend too much time thinking, 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 but we don't do. Um, we've got to break the cycle. And one of the best things that happened to me as a young person, when I was your age, I thought I was the smartest guy in the room. I was a kick-ass software programmer. I developed, I went into this company, and just a quick, quick story, a big integration company, billion dollar company, rose, I was there right through the whole process. And uh, I went to the founder of the company and I said, your company sucks. We need to build a better you know, application. It, back then it was client server and I said, you gotta build it on a network because to distribute all the stuff, it's done in big computers. It doesn't have to be done in big computers, it can be done all over the world. So I developed a plan, a business plan uh, to, to do that work. And I sent it to him and it took like a week or so before he contacted me. He said, come up to my office and I see my plan sitting on his desk. And he said, uh, did you write this? And I, and I was nobody, I was nobody, literally nobody. I was just a geek, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I wrote it. And he goes, and he starts flipping through. He said, I like this, there are a lot of cool ideas in here. There's some cool ideas. Um, but I don't want to do this. And he throws it down on his desk. He says, this is what I want to do. I want you to come up with a system. And he started developing a spec. And this first spec was something that maybe could be done. The second spec was something that was impossible. And the third spec, I couldn't even figure out how to do it. It was like so far in the future. He says, I want that by the end of the week. Get out of here. Tell me how you're going to build that in the next five days. So leave my office. And I, th I thought for sure when I left my office, my, I'm fired, right? There's no way. He's asking for something that does not exist, right? And uh, I stayed up two nights in a row, did not sleep for two days. I came back with a solution or something that at least held water, delivered it a day early. He asked me for it by Friday, I delivered it on Thursday. And uh, he called me right away and I said, that strategy worked. How many of you use that strategy when you're given a wicked problem, delivered early, thinking you can smoke them, thinking you're smarter than they are, right? So I thought I was going to outsmart this guy. There's no way I could outsmart this guy because this guy wasn't even playing on the same level. He's playing three level chess. So this guy says, uh, okay, here I am, haggard, you know, I haven't shaved, two days with no sleep, trying to hold it together. Yeah, I'm the smartest guy in the room. And he flips through it, just like this other one, throws on the dice. He says, I don't want to do that either. Good ideas, don't want to do that. I want you to quit your job. I was like, what? I just made principal there. I got an equity, you know, it was very, I want you to quit. I'm going to give you $100,000. I'm going to give you a customer. I'm going to give you two programmers. I want you to show me build it. So I had just been married and I went home and I told my new wife that I'm giving up my health insurance. We were trying to have a baby, by the way, and I want to go start a company. I have nothing to lose except for my wife, who I thought for sure was going to divorce me. And, and, uh, and uh, we, we started this little company together. And I wasn't an entrepreneur yet because the guy gave me 100 grand, two, two programmers and a customer. There was, what, what, what was I risking? Nothing, right? I was just risking the, the job, right? If I did a good job, I'd probably get another job, right? Uh, it wasn't until I was in it and starting to work on this new piece of software that I realized that it wasn't being the smartest guy in the room that really made me successful. It was the ability to know what I didn't know. And the, and the way I learned that lesson was he called me and he told me that. So this guy's name, name was Charles Rosati. He said, you know, the problem 
with you, Zoller. And I was like, oh my God, you know, this is my mentor telling me what my problem is. He says, you think you know everything. And he says, entrepreneurship has nothing to do with your intelligence. You're plenty smart, but uh, being an entrepreneur is knowing what you don't know. It's being comfortable with the ambiguity, being completely comfortable with the, with the problem that can't be solved, uh, being willing to talk to people that may be smarter than you, and be willing to assemble lots of different ideas in order to build something in the composite a little bit stronger. So give up on what you know and start thinking about what you don't know because only then will you be successful. Does that make sense to y'all? I thought he was crazy at the time. But it made a lot of sense to me because entrepreneurship is about living in ambiguity. So this idea is totally wrong. It's wrong-headed. Steve Blank figured that out a long time ago. You know, the old thinking, come up with an idea, write a plan, get a finance, build it, attempt to get a customer to buy it, fail, come up with another idea, right? And burn a lot of cash in the process. That was the old idea. The new idea is, you know, process of customer discovery. This is what Steve Blank was saying. Startups aren't small companies, they're market discovery tools. Use it as a tool to intera interact with the, the, the customer as the need and understand through that process the root problem, right? Through that, run lean. Don't build it, buy it, sell it. Build it, sell it, build it, sell it, build it, sell it, right? It's a different concept. Launch and learn is better than learn and launch. Get out there, do it. Get into it, build it. How many of you can build something? Right? I mean, that is, believe it or not, a rare capability. I honor you because you can build it, right? Use that. That's the first process. And then raise capital only when you scale. We'll talk a little bit about the execution model. So the basic idea, and this is the takeaway if you're interested, if you came here uh, to learn Lean Startup, this is the basic idea. There are three phases. The first one is a problem solution fit. Spend all your time understanding the problem first and building a solution that meets that problem. That's the first level. You don't have to spend much in many resources because it's just a process of uh, inquiry, right? So you're iterating to the next level, which is the problem market fit, trying to understand the nature of the market, how people buy, how they behave, how they act, how much are they willing to purchase it for, for instance, and ultimately trying to validate whether or not there's someone who wants to buy it. There's a term of art in Silicon Valley, do the dogs eat the dog food? I always hate it because I don't know, you know, and who cares about dogs? But, you know, that's real something. When you put the dog food out, you think that's the best dog food in the world. Does the dog eat it, right? You have to find out whether or not the customer really wants it. And guess what? If you build an entrepreneurial venture on the marginal benefit, you're going to fail. You know why? Because it doesn't really improve that much of your human condition, right? You're looking for a solution that will improve your human condition. And it has to be a strong margin, something that's giving them a pretty you know, compelling need, frankly. Uh, anything on the margin usually fails. You know, if you're doing a little bit better, they'll work around you. Because people are smart, and they don't want to trouble themselves. And if they don't have to pay, they definitely won't pay, right? Are you right? Students are the best at that. By the way, I notice there's food over here. Is that for these guys? Is this food for them? Well, yeah, I'm going to pass it around because you guys need free food, right? So here you go. Pass it around, would you? You probably don't. All of you are probably going to go to the gym after this, and you can't eat that stuff. Only after that process of iteration between the problem solution and the problem market do you have a venture. And you're always going back. And guess what? You never get it right the first time. You put up a set of hypotheses. You test those hypotheses. You keep on working it. And for those of you who are real scientists, and I bet you a lot of you are real scientists, when I use the term hypotheses, I have to bite my tongue because it's not really structural scientific hypotheses. There's not a real solid set of controls. There's not really uh, you know, a control group type of opportunity. This is kind of ham-handed hypotheses. Only after you do that work can you scale and grow through optimization, right? That's when you put resources in. So the idea is in the old days we used to put a lot of money in. I asked for $100,000, right? What was wrong-headed about it? He said, she should have said, go build it and then I'll give you money if it makes sense. There you go. So that now you know lean. You can check that one off, right? Um, the basic concept uh, is kind of uh, ham-handed hypothesis development. Come up with a, a set of assumptions based on what you know, the scenario being. Design an experiment to test those uh, hypotheses. Execute those tests. Deliver insight. Rinse and repeat. 
It's a cycle. When we talk about iteration, we're working that cycle. And what we're trying to do and what we're learning from the web is that cycle happens quick, more quickly, more quickly, more quickly, right? We're, got, we're going through that process many, many, many times and we're learning faster, right? Have you noticed that? We're learning, uh, we're, we're, our ex uh, the learning is accelerating in many ways when it's used by people like you or in many ways it's being unlearned, right? I, you know, I don't know how many times I get, uh, you know, from a Twitter feed, stupid stuff. You know, we're learning, you know, unlearning too, pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, in, in your hands, this is a very powerful tool. The truth of the matter is, unlike classical experimentation, that would be uh, more like a, you know, scientific method like you've been taught, Entrepreneurial experimentation looks at multiple hypotheses and many times in parallel and usually a messy experiment that gives you patterns and not real validatable or invaluable data, invaluable, excuse me, invalidatable data. Boy, that's a hard one. Say that twice. <laughs> Anybody say that twice? Invalidatable data. Um, the truth is, it's kind of a messy process, but you're looking for patterns. Yeah, when I do this, this always happens. Have you noticed that? And then I realize I can bet on that because I kind of think that this is going to happen multiple times. And the people who do it wrong usually try to base key decisions in the design of their solution based on anecdotal evidence, right? So they're basing it on a, a low end, right? The scientists in the room, you want to get statistically significant samples? Okay. This is ham-handed. What we want is a little bit more shots on goal. We want to get as much data as we can. We're trying to build as much of a case to see that pattern so we're making better decisions faster. So that's the key insight Steve Blank brings to the table. God bless him for doing it because he got us out of the business plan world. Uh, okay, but we need rigor. And I'm going to tell you about that. Rigor is being able to prosecute that process to the point where you really do get valid information. So challenging yourself in the same way that you challenge yourself or your professors insist upon the scientific process to get better data on the key decisions that are required to build a venture. And a lot of entrepreneurs, I find, don't have rigor. They phone it in. They try to find the way through. They maybe take a shortcut. Why? Entrepreneurship's about advantage. What's one advantage? Time. What can I eliminate? Time. How can I do it? Not being rigorous. So they may still make the dumb decisions. So it's not enough just to do the hypothesis formation and collect anecdotal data. Be rigorous about it. Have you noticed in really successful entrepreneurs, I've seen it, it's almost a function of obsession. Have you noticed that? Entrepreneurs are very successful, usually are very obsessive about changing what they want to change. And they think of it in a very sophisticated way, parallel process, in many cases nonlinear, you know, this is by, you know, if you're against scientific method, very stochastic process. A stochastic process that's actually giving you inputs from lots of different directions. But it's not science. In fact, I was invited to give a keynote at the Science of Entrepreneurship um, conference. And the first thing I said was, this isn't a science. It's not a science and it's not a discipline. This is a set of practices, right? This is human behavior. So I would challenge you all to be rigor, rigorous. Okay, here's, here's, a, here's a basic schema that, that Steve Link uses to describe the lean process. It starts in four blunks. The first chunk is customer discovery. The second chunk is customer validation. That two process step is a rigorous process. The third step is when you create a venture or enterprise, company creation. And the fourth step is when you scale that organization, you acquire capital to actually build it out. But the first two steps are the messy steps. They start with a problem solution fit, like I mentioned, and it starts with building a minimum viable product or service. You all heard that term before, right? That means basically a package of things that would allow you to test the, the problem you're trying to solve, right? Um, I'm gonna just talk about MVP for a minute. You already know what it means, but you're getting to the core problem, trying to get something that people can react to. Have you noticed you get better information? You know, I bet you a lot of you have done survey development, right? Have you noticed that some of the surveys give you data that's not really useful? Or you might ask the wrong question, right? And you can't go back because you've already asked the question, you pulled the data out, you've reported the data in some kind of document and you've already turned it into your professor. You can't go back, right? So how do you solve that problem? There are many techniques that you can do more iterative um, uh, data collection. What are some of those techniques? Using surveys or groups. Anybody throw them out? Focus groups, good examples. Can you describe a focus group? It's when you 
find like a group of customers that are similar segment, I guess, and you're yeah. asking questions all together and they kind of bounce ideas off of each other. Right, and you can actually take those questions, you know, A, B, this, that, if, then, you know, you can talk, take them through scenarios, right? And it's interesting, you mentioned a segment, right? Now, it's important when you're going after a set of customers, you might have an assumption of a segment, but in this process, you don't really know your segment. One of the best things, by the way, that doesn't get the kind of press that Steve Blank gets is a process called effectuation. Sarah Sarasvathy, she's a professor at the University of Virginia, she's talked about effectuation being this process of trial and error. It starts from the ugly bottom, you know? You're just trying to put things together. You know, it's literally like putting two sticks together and rubbing it. You know, does it work? Can you build a structure out of it? All of a sudden you can build a structure, you can build something bigger. Uh, focus groups one. Intercepts another where I can talk to Moto and say, okay, Moto, I got a problem, here's, here's a solution, do you like it? And Moto says, no, I don't like it, and this is why. And so I can ask questions, and that's an intercept type of process. We can crowdsource it, right? I can start saying, do you guys like what I'm dressed, how I'm dressed now? I, you know, I, I looked at myself in the mirror after I dressed, and I said, I look pretty brown, you know? I look very brown, and I'm maybe too brown, and you know, I'm already kind of a opaque white guy, you know? I, brown and, you know, what I look like, it doesn't work, you know? It doesn't work. But I could ask that, you all could tell me, and then you can tell me how I could dress better, right? You could, you could probably fix me up, right? I need a makeover, don't you think? Um, it would be good to do that. That's one way you can collect data. There are many ways you can collect data, but that doesn't give you enough. Think about the opportunity when you can put the stuff right in front of your face. I want to build an app, and here's what it's going to look like. Have you guys used some of the firmware that's available on your iPhone that you can dummy up an application? You can start to mess, it, mess, mess with it, and you can start playing with it, and you can actually do the swipes, and you can see basic functionality without programming anything, right? How many of you have used Keynote or PowerPoint to dummy it up? That's a good way. But the process of seeing it starts a real inquisition as to whether or not you're building something that people want. And then you've got to validate whether or not they want it to the extent they'll pay for it. Right? That's the key. All right. So MVPs will different, be different. You know, I talked to one, some of you guys are involved. Who was the BME guy? Okay. You were in, I can't remember what you were solving. Uh, uh, GI. Yeah, yeah. So how would you do it? Uh, I don't know if I want a minimum viable drug, and I certainly don't want a, a, a minimally viable laparoscopic device. I'm not so sure. But how would you do an MVP for your, your, your technique? Tell me the problem you're solving and how you're doing it. Um, the problem we're solving does involve an endoscopic tool. And like you're saying, there's obviously there's a big gap between um, in vivo testing. So we're breaking it down first, uh, bench top testing with uh, ex vivo tissue. Then that's successful, maybe an animal trial, and that's successful, let's see. And that's a regulated process. So you're taking it one step at a time. You're validating it at the first step, then the second step, then the third step. So that makes sense. It's a good way to go about doing it. And it's the only way through the regulatory process that you'll be able to do it. But you know, what, for every market, it's going to be different. I'm building software. I can show an MVP of you know, basically something on a mobile device. I'm building a device, an uh, engineered product. How many of you are engineers? Right? When, a lot of you are engineers. Wow. That's cool. Let's build something cool. I want to go over to that lab over there. It's a lot more fun than being in a lecture hall, don't you think? I, I'm allergic to tears. I don't like tears. You know, I want you all to kind of like, let's go make something. Let's, I don't know. Let's go play volleyball. I, you know, there's a lot of things we could rather be doing, right? Um, especially, you know, anyway. So the idea is that you could actually build something that's in your market. Engineering, you know, you're building something physical. You know, sometimes it's physical with information, with, uh, you know, smarts, um, with characteristics. Any uh, material scientists in here? Okay, tell me, tell, good. The one material science in the room, tell me what are the frontiers of material science and why should I care? What do you mean by the frontiers? Yeah, what, what's next? What's the next cool material coming up? I think, uh, more composites. More composites. It'll make cars lighter, planes lighter. Yeah. Things like that, which increase fuel efficiency. Totally. Make it safer. Yeah. Yeah. What about nano? Nano technology? Yeah. There's lots of potential there. A lot of good stuff there. On a smaller scale, it changes the properties completely. Okay. So a lot of drugs for sure there. Okay. You know, that's a big deal. Yeah. And new delivery mechanisms, things that are more efficacious, things that attack tumors. Yeah. You know, pretty cool stuff, right? All right. Any electrical engineers in the room? All right, tell me, what, what's the frontiers in electrical engineering? You know, hey, the oldest technology is electricity, right? It's yeah. Edison, it's, you know. Quantum in, computing. Yeah, okay. So you're getting into quantum computing through new circuit arrays and things of that nature? 
What other things? Help me out. Uh, I would say automation of a lot of systems. And yeah. Trying to, <laughs> trying to get everything working together in a, in a coherent, coordinated manner. So I was out at Singularity. Uh, have you guys heard of that? Yes. So the CTO of uh, Google, uh, the guy who wrote Singularity, I can't remember his name, terrible names. Never be a politician. Um, you know who I'm talking about? Um, oh gosh, I'm terrible. Anyways, uh, he, he, he said the whole thing's going to pivot on robotics, right? Google will be robot, a robotics company, right? How many of you are interested in robotics? I'm fascinated by it. I mean, that's pretty cool stuff, right? All right, do we have any uh, uh, people in biochemistry or chemistry? No chemists? Gosh, I was just with Eric Toon. We should drag him over here and see how to tell. Anyways, the whole idea is the context, the frontiers, then you think about how those frontiers could affect problem solving. How can you bring nanotechnology into new solutions? You know, uh, I, I never thought that a, a, a chemist who understands nanotechnology, a material scientist that understands uh, nanotechnology would be relevant to cancer oncologists, right? I always thought that can cancer was about excising tumors. No, it's about building new drug delivery mechanisms where nanomaterials will actually attack the tumor in its source. Right? It's pretty exciting stuff. So challenge yourself to put yourself where you are already schooled, and if you can build it, you're very valuable, right? So the other thing when you talk about rigor, one, you know, 2.0 entrepreneurship, you know, challenge yourself to build it. Here, here's a bunch of, you know, products that, you know, uh, that, that are out there. Have you guys seen the Dollar Shave Club, by the way? It's a great, great thing. I love it. Um, you know, I think of Missouri. That's a show me state. Show me, show me, show me, show me. When you can show me, it means something, right? You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. A design or storyboard is worth, worth at least those thousand, right? Can you draw it? Can you do a design of it? Can you do an AutoCAD? Can you do a simulation? Could you do a 3D print, right? Show me something. Uh, pic a picture is worth a thousand words, but a software mock-up, wireframes, demo racks, different ways that you can actually show the functionality. I ran into a team today that's been kind of, uh, uh, kind of in the bubble for a couple years, and not working their way through it, and they finally walked me through uh, a, a software solution that will change the world. And I was like, holy crap, you finally got it. Took them two years. They're going to revolutionize the way people buy things. And uh, we talked about how they could go about doing it. But it's only after they built it that I believed it. I didn't believe it. Uh, you know, for those of you doing data and visualization, scientific phenomena, you know, just show the data. Tell me what the data shows. You know, I, I was involved with a company that had a solution for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and they had a drug. And they, they were in a green monkey model, right? You know, and people talk about animal testing. We could have a really big, you know, this is an ethics class. But, you know, we have an interesting conversation about it. But here was the video. A fellow came up with a D1 agonist uh, for Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism, not what did I say, muscular dystrophy, Parkinsonism. And they showed the green monkey, and the, the green monkey was on the bottom of the cage and had been palsied its entire life. Couldn't move, couldn't feed itself. It was fed with a tube. They injected this D1 agonist. That monkey was up on its feet, and they showed it picking up some food and eating it for themselves. The first time it's ever done that, right? That thing made history. Because as a result, uh, there was a solution for a set of Parkinson uh, problems you know, that, that D1 agonist could, could solve. Show it. Show it. Show the data. Um, here's an example of a prototype. You know, this is just some kind of uh, silly device. But you notice it started with a drawing and maybe was a 3D print, maybe then a physical uh, structural uh, thing, and then maybe something with composites, right? I like to tell the story of my friend in, uh, in Denmark. And, you know, actually, I just got it. I'm so excited about this. This is a guy. I, want, I, wish, I wish I had the video of him telling the story. Um, can you help me out with this? So this is cool. This is a dude uh, named Jonas Eliasson who lives in, uh, he was, he's Swedish. He's living in Denmark, and he had to walk a long ways to his work. So he was tired of walking, uh, walking to work, and he decided he would try different things. So he started with inline skates, and he, he thought that was goofy. Then he tried to take his bicycle on the train, and he thought that was uh, cumbersome. And then he started building something that looks like a razor scooter on the left-hand side. And I'll show you. He works it through his prototype, and this is the dude. This is what he came up with. I just got it shipped to my uh, garage. This is a uh, human-powered Segway. The Me Mover is a crossover. So, so this was a guy who was like really driven by the need to solve human mobility. And you know, it's kind of a funny, how many of you have seen things like this? 
right? You've seen a lot of things like this. Uh, there's a, a really cool little business here in town in Durham. Have you noticed, uh, what's it called, the uh, Elf? Yeah. And what's the company called? Um, Organic, Organic Transit, right? Have you ridden in one of those? It's pretty cool, it's pretty cool. Still needs a little bit more iteration, but it's pretty cool. This guy started with, uh, look at the thing on the left, what does that look like to you? Looks like a razor, doesn't it? How many of you played with razors when you were little? You know, the little razor scooters? Th that's what he started, that was his first prototype. Second prototype, he added the cambering. Third prototype, he added the uh, kick uh, uh, gearing system, which uh, gives him speed. That thing can go 40 miles an hour with human power. But, you know, unfortunately, pretty flat space. They do have gearings, but it's not that great for hills. Uh, the, the next prototype allowed not only uh, for cambering and the gearing, but allowed it to fold. So you can put it in a bag and put it over your shoulder. And the, the last prototype is what he went with. And now it's really cool. I got the first one made out of Carolina Blue. Sorry. Uh, Carolina Blue one. And I should have brought it. And I should have taken it in the box. You guys could have helped me put it together. I'm excited about having. But this is an MVP process. And rigor is someone who can take it from a crude prototype to something that can be finalized in the same way that you, the humans evolved. Right? Isn't that cool? That's pretty wicked. Now, I don't know if this solution's going to work. Uh, now, I will tell you, in Amsterdam and in Copenhagen and Stockholm, all the tour companies are using these instead of Segways. Because what's wrong with the Segway? They look stupid. Yeah, they look stupid. What else? <laughs> it takes time to learn how to use it. Yeah, you know, boy, and they're a little frightening. That gyroscopic thing is kind of strange, right? <coughs> what else? Did anyone ever bought one? They're super expensive, right? That's why they're all being used by tour companies. Tour companies capitalize it and then have long tail. Business model's different. This guy may be able to disrupt that. Uh, what are alternatives? So I, I just, uh, could you mind um, bringing up another video? So, okay, I'm just riffing now at this point. So I, I've been obsessed by this problem, human mobility. And then there's another group at the MIT uh, Media Lab that came up with a thing called the Copenhagen Wheel, and I'm getting one of these, too. Both of them, by the way, were Kickstarter deals. You know, uh, the, the first one, Me Mover, made about a half million dollars in Kickstarter. And this one is actually pretty cool. Do you mind just doing Copenhagen Wheel? Have you guys seen this thing? Yeah. This thing's cool. So, please. So, I'm, I'm curious, what was the actual MVP that they showcased in the Kickstarter? Like how far along were Yeah, it was actually the fifth one on the uh, It was pretty finished. Yeah. And they said, you want one and we'll build it. And then he just shipped uh, 5,000 of them worldwide. And now he's got it all production ready. So they're ready to buy. You can buy them online, memover.com. Yes, check it out. Can you make it big? This is the Copenhagen wheel. It turns your ordinary bicycle into a smart electric hybrid by simply replacing and you can cycle just about anywhere. How about that for a value proposition? One, two, three. Transform the city. Thank you. That's great. All right, so, so w w these two things were created in the same context, trying to save two different problems. Uh, let's say all of you have $100,000 to invest. You have to invest in one of the two. There's no other innovation that you found that are at this point. By the way, I've done that screen, and I've invested in both of them. Uh, how many of you would invest in the Me Mover versus the Copenhagen Wheel? Me Mover? Okay. Copenhagen Wheel? How many of you would not invest in any of them? Okay, why? Can I ask you? I don't have any use for either one. Okay, good for you. So you are thinking right away, I'm not the customer. You know, you're not the customer. Really fascinating problem. The reason why I find that really interesting is um, both of them are trying to solve similar problems. Urban mobility trying to get a real handle on uh, human problems, right? What's the problem in Copenhagen? What do you think? It's its own city. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the world. To try it, to implement something like that in New York, it's, it's not going to pick up. It, it, it's hard, for sure. Everyone rides a bicycle in Copenhagen. Um, it's not true any, everywhere, right? Uh, uh, campuses might work. Um, the other uh, key challenge is trying to solve is mobility off of transit, right? So it's a based on a transit assumption. Yeah. So it's probably both urban. Both are attractive, aren't they? Both are interesting. I will tell you, I, went, I flew up to Boston to, uh, uh, what's the name of the company um, that does the Copenhagen Wheel, a super pedestrian, and uh, they were still making them there. And I test rode one before I decided to do the investment. And uh, they literally set this, this phone, phone in. And they, I said, they said, what kind of ride do you want? I said, I just want to get some assistance. And it kicked in at three levels. 
And at the third level, it was throwing me into cars. It was amazing how powerful this thing was. And as soon as I got on the bike, I was like, I couldn't wait to get my checkbook out. I mean, it was such a cool thing. It could change the world. And why, was it, why would that change the world over all the e-bikes? I was just sitting next to the world's expert in e-bikes on an airplane. And I asked him, I said, have you checked out the Copenhagen wheel? Oh, I don't it won't work. E-bikes are definitely here to say, what's wrong with an e-bike? You guys looked at that market? You have to charge it. You have to charge it, yeah. What else? You looked at the pricing of those guys? Just another segue, right? So, you know, I, I'm looking for rigor. I want to see rigor. I want you to go through all the process of understanding the customer need. What I loved about Jonas is he solved it and solved it, but based on a concept that he had. So let's go to the next step in Lean, which is that product market fit. You have to start to understand, once you've solved the problem, what the market looks like. You know, how does the market behave? How do you sell? Why is this one person back here not going to ever buy a Copenhagen wheel or a meme mover? We gotta understand why, you know? And not only I'm not, not interested, I just don't like that kind of stuff. I'd rather walk, I'd rather run, I'd rather ride my car, right? right? Um, so the iteration we talked about, you look at the, the challenges, uh, the problems, you design a solution, you test that solution, you evaluate it, and then you look at new requirements. You're always going around that cycle, right? The idea of customer development is you actually use that process of recognition to collect data, leverage insights, execute those insights, and then pose new marketing problems. Looks just like lean, right? Uh, the difference is what you're trying to do is identify the nature of the problem and then solve that problem. And in order to solve that problem, you have to start to specify the market. And that's when we get into your, your, your point, which is look at a segment. Try to understand one kind of customer, right? And you can sell them again. Why do you care about a segment? You ever heard that term? What's well, segment? Why do you care? So let me just draw a picture up here. You guys ever heard of a TAM, total addressable market? A TAM is the full market. You know, when you see uh, pitch decks that say it's a $1.9 billion market. Wow, that's impressive. You know what? I don't care. How much of that market can you get? Probably none of it. You know why? You haven't done it yet. Right? So that's the TAM. Then you have a SAM. A SAM is a serviceable, addressable market. That's the addressable market. That, that is the market you can touch. This is the market that might be in different geographies, might be in different segments that you can't begin to serve because they're already served well. This is what's addressable. But I'm really interested in the SAM. The SAM is the serviceable, obtainable market. What can you prove to me you can obtain with your effort. I'm much more interested in the bottom up. How do you build the SOM, the argument for the market that you can obtain relative to the TAM? You know, just tell me what you can buy. You know what I do? I look into the numbers. I actually uh, look in, in a proposal and just say, you know, with this capacity on this team, can you sell it and how? And there are a lot of choices. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. So you work through this and you try to figure out how big the market can be, how much can you acquire, What's the growth rate in that market? What will people be willing to pay? Is the market mature or is it in flux? I love changing markets because you can take advantage of those trends, those waves that drive that market. You know? So those are the starting points in developing the market. Then the next step is to define the business model. Because the difference between a business that's successful and unsuccessful, believe it or not, you've done all this innovation on your MVP, you've taken the meme mover from the razor to the cambering finished product, so what? You can innovate just as much on the business model. Let's riff on that for a minute. You all might be thinking, I can, I can innovate hugely on products and services, right? A lot of you have that capability. You know you can innovate just as much on the way that you compete in the market through the business model. So let's put yourself in Jonas's perspective. Jonas has the meme over. He has it perfected, it's done. He's ready to sell, he's got a ton of them in inventory. How does he sell that thing? Now we're innovating in the business model. Think about how does Jonas sell the meme over? Like you're saying, you might have the initial adoption problems that we are putting it on campuses or in cities where they have those rent a bike stations. Great. Why? It's, I guess to uh, test, his, test I guess, the market. Yeah. So Plus you're creating referenceability, right? They're seeing other people on it. It's not so weird, right? The first time, I, I can't wait to get on this thing and drive it around campus, because I'm gonna look like a total geek, right? <laughs> and people are gonna say, look at the geeky professor on the meme mover, what is that? And then they're all gonna be curious about the meme mover. And then I'm gonna try to get the two or three coolest kids in my class, I'm gonna have them go and spin around with it. <laughs> and that's when people will think it's awesome, 
right? I gotta find the coolest kid. I'm gonna bring it over here. And who are the coolest kids in this room? I mean, let me know. Because we'll figure out how to turn that meme over. Okay, so you get referenceability, that's one way. Now, are you thinking I need to sell it? I'm gonna set up a little shop, I'm gonna you know, take a corner of the building, you know, at, collect checks at a table, fold, unfold a table? It's called a B2C market, right? Consumer market. Is that the best way to sell that thing? So little old Jonas, Jonas in, in Copenhagen, how does he sell? You use some branded distributors to distribute the product out to the market. Right, so there's distribution, right? There are people that sell mobility devices. There are retail outlets. Where are mobility devices sold today? Now we're innovating, right? Think about bicycle stores, scooter stores, you know? Where would you buy something like this? Think about how it's sold. You have to think about the value chain. Who sells it? How is it distributed, right? Um, that's a B2B model. Guess what? Most successful entrepreneurs at the early stage, they compete B2B before they compete B2C. Why? Consumer markets are expensive and they're hard. Your margins are higher, but they're harder to address. You usually find distribution advantage. Why is Etsy taken off? Etsy just went public. What, did, what was Etsy? Do you guys know what Etsy is? What, what, what fundamentally was that innovation? And it's a business model innovation. It's just an un, really an unimaginative website. What was, it, what, what, what was it doing? It's just a marketplace for crafted products. Exactly. What's the innovation? You're providing a platform for uh, businesses to connect with consumers. Right. And the consumers aggregate that demand, and then it forks off based on your preferences. So I can buy a crocheted thing because I love crochet. You can buy a beaded product because you love beaded things. And uh, you know, somebody can buy you know, fancy underwear. Right, because you want fancy beaded underwear. I don't know. You know, I have no idea. But what's cool is it's kind of that marriage making process. So I took you through this process of innovation. Innovation was the product. Innovation can be the business model. So be, be uh, aware of that. Um, Alex Osterwalder, a professor in Switzerland, came up with this thing called the business model canvas. Have you ever seen this thing? So it's pretty well socialized. I think it's a good starting point, but it's not a good ending point. Okay, I was gonna tell you, performance entrepreneurship, 1.0 entrepreneurship, Alex Osterwalder. 2.0, 3.0, no business starts with the same business model it ends with. Alex is a great way to communicate your first business model. Can you show business model two? Can you show business model three as you scale to eat more of that market, right? Now I'm talking more business. Am I turning anybody off yet? You're like, I'm not really interested in business. <laughs> the truth is, it's pretty cool, because what you're trying to do, what are you trying to do? You're trying to solve problems and address needs, and what is a market? It's a group of people who have the same problems. Break it down. Business is actually very, very creative. All right, so help me understand this. Can you all define this word? I defy you to find a good definition. There's not even a decent academic definition for the term business model. What is a business model? Anybody want to take a shot? how you can make money out of the product that you're going to do. Yeah, good. So you went right to it. You don't screw around, man. <laughs> how are you going to make money? Good for you. That's fundamentally what it is. There's a front end to that, but let's dig it a little deeper. But you're right on, brother. What, what's the other part? I was thinking more just like sustaining development. Yeah. It's the operations of the company. It's the business logic of the firm. In order to sustain a profit, through its management of revenue and costs, right? It's how you make money, but using a sustainable process. And actually, if you go back to that business model canvas, it's looking at the key activities and resources, the competency of the enterprise, and how you're gonna sell channels, distribution, customer interface, and the like. Ultimately, equated to dollars and cents, revenue, cost. That's revenue, that's cost, right? Um, so, I think a 3.0 business model, we did 1.0, 2.0, a 3.0 business model is actually understanding customer needs. Um, have you ever noticed that uh, entrepreneurship tends to kind of shy away from big companies? You know, we usually say, just start it, why work with a big company? Who has the cash though? The big companies. Have you noticed that a lot of entrepreneurs are successful working with big companies? One of the things I'd like to, to disabuse you of is those big companies can be very helpful to you. You know, in many cases, they're looking for you, they're looking for innovation, and you know what they got? Money. That's pretty much all they got, because they don't have you. You bring a lot to them. 
So don't be afraid of talking to corporate partners who could help you figure it out. Um, I want you to just, I'm going to finish here, but I just, I have a whole diatribe. We could go on all night. But I honestly think there's a difference between a high performance entrepreneur and someone who's just kind of phoning it in. And I'm going to leave you with the idea, challenge yourself to be rigorous, challenge yourself to solve problems that are worth solving, and challenge yourself to learn the skills to not only innovate on the product and the service, but innovate in the way that the business is built or the venture is built. And then you'll be a high performance entrepreneur. Is that a good way to close it? Okay, I'm going to open it up to questions. It's awesome, please. interacting with a company or a corporate partner whose um, base of expertise is relevant to you know your own startup I mean for example if you're a wearable tech company um, would it is it important to say go for a company like Nike or something as such or could you really just broaden well, they're, 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 uh, you certainly should go for diversity. You know, when you're, like for instance, in wearable tech, I'm wearing a Jawbone. Uh, you know, this is a simple device. How many of you are satisfied with the biometric devices that are out there now? Right? I mean, they're just like two or three. You can do many. Can I tell you, can I, can I tell you a quick story? Yeah. So you got one too? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not satisfied with this. It's like three, right? There's... It doesn't, the next, uh, it doesn't do heart rate, which is the one I wanted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I think the Apple Watch will have. But. Yeah. And then there'll be something after that, and something after that, and something after that, and something after that. So there's a dude over at UNC named Keith Kosas. He's a pediatric intensivist. So he takes care of sick babies. And uh, he came up with an early warning system for child mortality that predicted, based on evidence, you know, big data, uh, which babies were sick enough that they could die. And it interacted with the emergency room nurses so that they knew when to intervene to keep the baby from dying. So it was a simple process, red, yellow, green. When they were yellow, nurses need to help. And then they could figure out the data. He used 99 biometric signals that came off of all of the equipment that's around. So biomedical engineering, you got all the equipment in the hospital room, used 99 different biometric signals. Then I ran into another uh, uh, engineer over at NC State that was saying that the tympanic membrane in your ear is actually a really good interface to collect biometric data. So you're putting your earphones in, and you're getting biometric data. And I was thinking to myself, what an amazing thing if we could get the guy who understands the ear thing at NC State and Keith Kosas over at UNC who understands biometric modeling to actually come up with a predictive model. There's enough you know, uh, memory in my cell phone that I probably could carry most of that data around with me. I don't need to be interacting with the cloud to, to process it. And when I'm running down the street and listening on my earphones, it can tell me I better run to the emergency room and I'm going to have a major cardiac event, right? And this guy could do that. We could do that right now with two guys within five miles, right? 15, well, 15 miles. Um, and some Duke engineers out there that can make that happen. So go get Keith and go get the tympanic membrane guy at NC State. I don't remember his name. I'll give you the name. And go build that thing. It'd be so much better than this. Now, what, what happened with Keith, Keith is he went to General Electric, who has a lot in the medical device marketplace. And they said, oh, we really like your stuff. And they invested in the first thing is they wanted just to see what it's doing. There are many ways to engage. You know, it's a channel strategy. So I would argue... If Keith were doing the right thing, he'd probably talk to five of the big market leaders. And in the, in the device world, he was talking to Siemens. He was talking to, uh, uh, you know, um, I don't know, some of those guys, uh, various med device companies. And he'd get different perspectives from each of them. And then each of them would have a different fit and a different way you could work with them. But it gives you a good way of getting good feedback and then a partner that immediately, you have a partnership with General Electric, his profile changes. You know, he's taken seriously. To try to take the best from different companies. You bet. If you can. You. Yeah. And try to play them off one another. Because they want you more than you want them. Yeah. You don't need them. They need you. Yeah. Right? If you are to think about talking to a bigger corporation like that, how, what, like, does it matter what stage you are in your development? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. And if you're really early, they'll give you feedback, but they really won't take you seriously. It's be rigorous. Try to push as far as you can. Um, interacting with them, though, at different points because they'll teach you different things, uh, what they need. You know, um, someone in Silicon Valley once told me, the secret of Silicon Valley is that the big money corporations tell the entrepreneurs what they need, and the entrepreneurs go build it, and then they buy it. I don't know if it's true, but you know, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? There's this, it's in the stew out there.
please. Mara? Yeah. Um, just building on this one, so, um, say I did the, uh, read the, this Lean Startup, I thought this is really fit to the application model. It's a software application. It's quick and um, you know, it's a shorter turnaround. And, and my focus is hardware engineering. And then hardware engineering, typical customer is the big corporations. And they don't meet so many people. They are not caring about the small guy uh, who don't know who has no potential yet. Um, I think that's a, a key challenge to have a you know, lean startup in a hard engineering. That's true. I, I think that, you know, I think you may have a different experience. So just just give us a, a bit about you know, um, some some tips on how we are going to use this model for hard engineering. Yeah. So. Um I think that part of it is trying to understand what the industry problems are, you know, frontier problems. And you guys are generally, as, as scientists in, in, in uh, working in the university environment, you're on the frontier, you're working with faculty that are generally on the frontier. So introducing new technologies. And you use the same st logic that I was just using with Keith and the guy with the earphones. It's like try to combine technologies. You don't have to invent everything. You know what will stop you dead in your track is you think you, can you have to invent everything. <clears throat> combine, integrate. I love, in hardware engineering, putting a whole set of innovations together. It's, it, you'll never know what the conversations are. If you notice in teams that are diverse, usually come up with better solutions, different perspectives. Uh, I honestly believe that that's also true in, in business development. So I have a question about your point about rigor. So I work in healthcare, I do a lot of, like, where you're talking about like, predictive analytics in healthcare. And I work with a lot of like med school faculty who, on the spectrum of rigor, the rigor that they demand in like evidence or good evidence is sometimes I fear well above and beyond the rigor that you need to show value. Oh, that's interesting. So, what's rigorous enough? Like, like one of yeah. the phrases that I have two mentors who are both MD MBAs, and I think of them as the people who tell me not to be rigorous, and they always yeah. tell me, "Don't let perfect." the enemy of good. Yeah, shades of gray. Yeah. You know, I even think that's true even with things that have to be, you know, I remember during the dissertation process saying the best kind of dissertation is a done dissertation, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and I bet you a lot of you are in that situation. Um, there is a shade of gray, I think. Um, when you're dealing with human health, uh, you know, you have to close every loop you can, but, uh, you know, when you're in, in innovation, I think at a certain point you have to kind of just say it's it's better than what we got. Yeah. So I guess to follow up, like as an investor, what does it mean for me to hand you a publication versus Silch. analysis that I've done on my own and I can show you? Oh, okay, that's different. Third party validation is oftentimes useful. You know, what it does is it says, yeah, not only do you have a, a good sense of the data that's required to complete the task, but you've had third party validation. I think in med devices and anything biomedical, very, very important. Uh, in in non-human, you know, health uh, scenarios, I don't think it's very important. The publishability usually isn't the reason why. We get all, you're going to have a seminar on intellectual property. It's fascinating. Most businesses are, are, are based on a competitive barrier that's just a trade secret. You know, no one else can do it because they assemble their skills differently. They're, they don't really care about their intellectual property. You're going to find that's contrary to most people who really make it their practice to try to patent everything. You know, most businesses I see that are successful don't protect very well. Um, not always true. If you've got the secret sauce, patent it. Yeah, I just wanted to build on that a little bit and talk about platform technologies. So, uh, especially in the medical space, um, Bob Langer at MIT says that yeah. the three things you need are, you know, platform technology, a high impact paper, and a blocking patent. So, how does this sort of framework fit into, uh, you know, trying to take a platform technology that's been developed and then find the best way to use it? I never put that connection together that Langer actually, you know, started the dialogue around platform technology. So the question is, how how does that framework stand up against what I'm saying is, you know, good enough? That's right. And how do you apply sort of the lead? philosophy oh. when you're in that, that situation. I honestly think L Langer is almost the model of the rigorous entrepreneur. Uh, he's closing every loop and the, the, t the paper is his test, right? He's using that as a vehicle to make sure all the right data is collected. Uh, so he's really kind of to tying it with a bow and sh finishing the package. Um, uh, that's a style and I think in his market it's probably pretty important. Uh, not every market's like that. You know, he's one of the 
you know, believe it or not, he's not only one of the most foremost, he's a triple academy scientist, he's Academy of Engineering Sciences and Medicine, and he's the biggest patent holder in the United States, and he is on more boards than anyone else. So he's, he's a rock star on all levels. So he's a guy who ties every bow. And you know how he does it? I honestly think he trains generations of people. His innovation really is the trainees underneath him. He doesn't do all that stuff. There's no way. He, no one human could do all, all that he's accomplished. But it's something he should be very proud of. That's he's someone you, I would aspire to be. An amazing person. So if, if you're a startup and you want to contact certain large corporation, how would you recommend that contact? Like who, who should you contact? How would that? Never, never be afraid. You know, I'm not kidding. LinkedIn is your best tool. Uh, you've got second degree connections. All of you are connected to the people you need to talk to within one degree of separation. Usually you can get an introduction. Uh, leverage it. You know, don't be afraid to go right to the top. You know, they're harder to get and people have gatekeepers. But if you have a good argument, you've got a good pitch, You've got a good way to get through. You know why we teach elevator pitching? It's about being persuasive in the first, first uh, encounter. If I can persuade you to let you through the gate, then you get to the second gate, and then you get to the third gate, and you get to the fourth gate. Uh, just try to build that persuasive package. A good argument always breaks down the limit. Um, Facebook, you, your generation's gonna own that. You know? Facebook's just the beginning, right? Uh, you, most of you are abandoned Facebook at this point, right? You know, it's amazing what's happening now in social networking. That's a lot of what I do in my research. And uh, there's a trust and reciprocity function in a network. You've got to understand where there are trusted relationships, but trusts are based on follow through. So if you make a commitment, you actually deliver on that commitment. Just start there, you know. Um, don't be afraid to go after people that you need. Find the best people. I do submit to one thing in entrepreneurship. Build the best team you possibly can. Don't just look for your friends and the people around you. Look for the people you need to execute the business. Every business is different. And you will contact them and tell them, uh, basically, I have an idea and I'd like, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, something like that, and then whatever comes. That's exactly right. I'll give you a story real quick. Uh, uh, no serious radio. Have you noticed uh, whenever you go under a bridge, the radio signal, satellite signal cuts out? And I was like, you know, we've been caching data for 50 years. So I had a background in, in software. So I said, why can't you just loop the, the, you know, play it forward 30 seconds, and when it's interrupted, just catch it up, right? So you're not playing what's going on. It's 30 seconds delayed, and when there's an interruption, you're just cutting away from that, and then you expand it when you can. Uh, you know, it's buffering. So I started contacting Sirius, and I worked through, and I got to the head of R&D of Sirius, and I said, I want to give this idea to you. I mean, you, you will be able to stay in business if you take this idea. And they were like, wow, that's amazing. You know, thank you for that. Um, but it was really fun. I, the only thing I had was my idea and my ability to use LinkedIn to find the right person. And they accepted it. Um, at certain points, I didn't think they were going to go, and I loved it because it was a lot of, it was a fun exercise to kind of just, I'm going to give you something to save your company, and that was the reason why I got through. They wanted to be able to save their company. I mean, how many of you are listening to Apple Radio now or one of the, you know, online radio stations? Sirius is like dead already, right? I mean, uh, even Howard Stern just left Sirius. It's, it's, it's a dead duck, largely because no one wants to deal with having to have line of sight to the satellites, right? It's a hassle. I don't know. So I think, you know, I've kept you guys long enough. I've enjoyed, this has been huge, right? I've really enjoyed it. This is big for me. I, I, I love being over here. Um, you know, let me come more often. Have me come over. So it's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, I'm, my email is zoller at unc.edu. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Ted underscore Zoller. Uh, I think my name's on the front of this thing. I'll bring it to you. And uh, you know, I'd be glad to help you if you've got some uh, ventures you need help with. You've got a hell of an infrastructure here at Duke. So, and Judd Staples is your man over here. Uh, if you need to access the infrastructure and ecosystem at Duke, I would recommend you, um, you uh, uh, use the ecosystem of Durham as well. Uh, the American Underground uh, is on fire. It's really a great ecosystem for entrepreneurship. So uh, leverage this resources in the community as well.